What's up guys, welcome back to another video on the channel, Journey2GC. Today we have kind of a different video. It's going to be talking about the Guide to Genetic Counseling textbook. So, I started reading this book as was suggested or um, recommended by one of the counselors I spoke with, Shannon Detweiler, a couple weeks back. And so, I ordered this book, I got it, you know, just a used copy of it. This is definitely not the latest edition. And I spoke with a, a different counselor about is the fact that this was published long ago and probably not changed too much. So it's possible that some of the ideas that this is teaching are, while, you know, fundamental, they might not be the most up and coming topics or ideas in genetic counseling. So that's something I'm planning to make other videos about, about more recent updated topics. but. As far as the foundation and learning some of the lingo used in the field and understanding the core values, I think this is going to be a really great experience. I've already read a couple chapters of it, and so I want to start to kind of give a review of that. So if you don't feel like really reading the whole thing or you're just curious, we could go over some of that. So to start off, this is really just going to be kind of touching on some of the stuff in the first chapter, which I thought was pretty cool. It's essentially just going to be a history of genetic counseling. And so the term genetic counseling was coined in 1947 initially, what they called the eugenic stage of genetic counseling. So that was the first of four stages that the eugenic model, then the medical preventative model, the decision-making model, and then the psychotherapeutic model. So in 1947, when this term was coined, um, this was, would have been during what they called the eugenic model stage. And so, um, what they define here as the eugenic model is that um, eugenics was the study of agencies under social control that may improve or impair racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. And so I know in high school, even I learned some stuff about eugenics and it comes up in every biology class and all that stuff, but definitely it was some interesting times with some questionable, um, questionable ethics and questionable methods, but um, today we know that's not really the way we go about things anymore, um, but granted they didn't know that much about uh, DNA and genetics back then. In terms of actual human genetics, there was still a lot to be discovered, and so that would lead you to the medical preventative model, which is next. So this is talking more about like preventative medicine, which is what it claims the entire field of medicine is moving towards at the time, and so this was also a step of you know getting away from advising people of how they should go about things which was something that would have been forced during the eugenics model, basing things off of genetic risk purely on empirical observations so that families could avoid recurrences of disorders that had already occurred. This was more of observing trends with disorders within a family and then trying to base their next steps off of preventing that reoccurrence based on uh, the behavior that had already been exhibited that might have led to that occurrence, which was still a little bit shaky, especially because it mentions this was just after the discovery of the actual structure of DNA, so they really hadn't had a lot of information for a long time about this. And it says that even back then they thought there were 48 chromosomes in the human genome, so clearly they were, um, there was a lot to be learned and a lot to be improved upon at this time uh, for this specific model. The next model is the decision-making model. In this model they speak a lot about different diseases that were able to be identified, such as Tay-Sachs, such as Down syndrome, Kleinfelter syndrome, Turner, trisomies 13 and 18. So they had a lot more insight and they were able to finally start really empirically showing um, when people had these afflictions. This meant that people had new options for how to go about their disorders. It also notes that at this time, uh, during this model, things were really starting to go towards the direction of emphasizing patient autonomy. And a word they always use in conjunction with that is non-directiveness. So I've heard that in a couple of the interviews I conducted on this channel, is that um, a big thing was and is um, non-directiveness in terms of showing all the options that the patient has uh, in their treatment and moving forward, but not necessarily pushing one of those options with a higher priority than another one based on what the counselor thinks because it truly is up to the patient at the end of the day. Finally, that brings us to the psychotherapeutic model, which as far as this book is concerned, would still encompass the modern day. I'm not sure if that's the case anymore. Like I said, I believe this was published in 1998 um, or around then, which is a long time ago. And with a rapidly growing field, that's definitely a long, long time. But 
uh, the, it's not gonna change the history that we're talking about now. So this model really focused on clinical visit with the patient and really taking into account all their lifestyle factors that would go into how they interpret the information they're hearing from the counselor and how they're going to make their decisions and move forward. So like it says here, exploring with clients their experiences, emotional responses, goals, cultural and religious beliefs, financial and social resources, family and interpersonal dynamics, and coping styles has become an integral part of the genetic counseling process. And so these are skills that we kind of see more today, taking into account people's uh, lifestyle and really seeing how the patient will be affected by the information that you're giving them and then being that support once you do deliver that information. So the next step in the history that they describe here is the formal definition of genetic counseling by the American Society of Human Genetics. Uh, this happened in 1975 and there's a really long definition here that and all what is entailed within the definition but there is an initial part that just sums up how they define this. So genetic counseling is a communication process which deals with the human problems associated with the occurrence or risk of occurrence of a genetic disorder in a family. And so that's a very broad oversight as to what this actually is. As we know, there's a lot more that goes into it in terms of um, the emotion and how you really take time to deal with the patients nowadays. But um, this is what in 1975 was formally defined. This definition also stressed four different components. This is the longer part of the definition, but to sum it up, the first is that this is a two-way interaction. It's, it's a lot different from the eugenic model where things were kind of asserted as what's correct and what needs to happen, but this is really acknowledging that the patient and the counselor are working in harmony to come to what's the best decision for that patient moving forward. The second is that Genetic counseling is a process, and especially with the sensitivity and complexity of the information that's being conveyed to the patient, this is something that can happen over a longer period of time. And it's, it's a process that can be revisited and not just you know a one visit kind of deal. Third is the emphasis on a client's autonomy. So this is essentially the non-directiveness that we just talked about, but this is something that was stressed by the American Society of Human Genetics when they were putting out this definition. And then the fourth component here is that because the occurrence of a genetic disease or the risk of occurrence of genetic disease can have a family-wide impact in terms of just the emotional component of people and of course the, the potential risk that would be posed to other family members once one of their family members is identified to have a disease or carry a disease, the inheritance of a genetic disease can have implications for a lot of family members that are related to the individual who's afflicted. Um, genetic counseling conversations tend to have a lot larger of a scope of who is actually going to be medically affected by the diagnosis. So because of that, um, they really, really want to emphasize how genetic counseling requires a specific training um, in the counseling component where you are able to talk to these families and really make sure you're providing them all the support they need when this information can kind of come as a shock across an entire family. So even before that definition was put out by the ASHG, you know, they realized the need for specific training programs for individuals that are going to provide these very specific um, set of skills in their service instead of just a medical doctor or other medical professionals who would be sharing this information with families. They really wanted to have that those training programs like they do today that kind of specify genetic counseling training in terms of uh, intense human genetics knowledge and then also counseling expertise so that they can really combine those in the most effective way. And so in 1969, Sarah Lawrence College was the first genetic counseling program to be established. And it's kind of funny because this, to date this book, it says um, at the time of publication, there were 25 programs like this, but uh, we know that today there's over 50. So that's really a testament to how quickly it's growing. And I know there are some that are still in the process of being established. So that's very exciting. So the next major milestone for genetic counseling would be in 1979 when the National Society of Genetic Counselors, the NSGC, was formed. And this is a society that, you know, I've mentioned on this channel before. This is where you can go to find resources on genetic counseling when you are actually a genetic counselor or you are a prospective student or even if you're trying to get information about genetic counseling as a patient. So this has been a hugely a helpful resource for me personally and I'm sure in the actual profession this will become really helpful as well. So this was a milestone for them creating their own society and their own formal community of genetic counselors and so they established like an annual meeting, a code of ethics, all that kind of stuff and so 
that was a really big component and a really important time that set Jenna Counseling on a more formal and structured path for going forward. And that's definitely helped contribute to the, the massive growth and need it has today. Another interesting thing that this book talks about is the certification for Jenna Counseling. So to be a CGC certified Jenna Counselor, now you have to graduate from an accredited program and pass the board exam, and then you can become a certified genetic counselor. What this talks about is that the American Board of Medical Genetics established that eligibility for certification in genetic counseling required at least a master's degree in a relevant discipline, provision of genetic counseling in 50 diverse cases described in a logbook submitted with the application and letters of reference for three other geneticists. So before the programs were really uh, widespread and accessible. They used to have people come from a relevant field, maybe genetics or you know some other some other medical discipline, and just basically do shadowing, be exposed to 50 diverse cases, and, and do a logbook of what those cases entailed. So um, I guess that would basically be shadowing. I'm not really sure how that worked, but it says you know now the ABGC requires applicants to have graduated from an accredited genetic counseling training program. So it is interesting that you used to be able to come from any any discipline, which obviously. This was back when there were far, far fewer genetic counselors and there already still is need for people to come into this field. But back then, um, obviously it would have been even fewer. And so they pulled people from different disciplines if they were interested enough and could kind of get this genetic counseling exposure. So that's most of the history that was extremely relevant, in my opinion, from this chapter. I thought those were pretty interesting milestones for different parts of genetic counseling. And I will leave you with this conclusion paragraph, which I thought was just a really nice way to sum everything up going forward. Being a member of a relatively small profession that deals with issues at the cutting edge of science, medicine, and ethics requires a commitment to continued growth and to the assumption of responsibility for helping other health professionals, policymakers, and clients understand genetics and its implications. The challenges are many, but the personal and professional rewards are enormous. So I think that sums it up pretty well. Um, that was just a very generic kind of background on the history of the field, which I had no idea about prior to this. So it's, it's interesting how they used to be able to pull people from different specializations and different certifications into genetic counseling before they had enough programs to be developing new genetic counselors every single year through those small cohorts that they do have. So I hope you found that interesting. Let me know if that's something you want to see more of. Obviously, there's not going to be much more history content in this book, but um, it does go over a lot of the methods and fundamentals of genetic counseling and look out for some more videos from this book and what I think of it. I'll see you next time.